So welcome to iTelescope webinar. We have a new series today. My name is Christian Zoss. I'm the astronomer in charge, and I'm really pleased today to introduce to you, you Mark Poppenchok. Mark Poppenchok is from the American Museum of Natural History. He's a postdoc. He's just finished his doctorate, which is so exciting. It's a very difficult transition, usually. And before that, he was at the City University of New York. So, Mark, if you are here, just come in. Just going to Hello. wait a moment. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Very nice to see you, Mark. We're so happy you could make it. We don't have many postdocs, so congratulations from me and from everyone for, <laughs> for, for doing this very difficult step. I know it is. And so congratulations. Mark's got an incredibly interesting background. So, Mark, I'm going to hand it over straight away to you. Okay. And, so go on. Yes. Great. Uh, thank you, Christian, for this introduction. And also, uh, I was just kind of blown away by the kind of community you've got already going in the chat, and it's... Um, really something special to see that these are there are people tuning in from all over the world. Um, so let me share my screen so that we can get started. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Mark Poppenchok, as uh, you've heard. I, in fact, I can now say Dr. Mark Poppenchok, as, uh, as you heard, I finished my PhD uh, literally uh, last week, essentially the final paperwork. And what I didn't realize is that the last person to say whether I'd get a PhD or not wasn't my advisor, it wasn't the head of the department, but it was the librarian uh, of my school because the librarian had to agree with the final formatting of the dissertation document. But all that paperwork has gone through and uh, now I'm a doctor. And so I'm here today to talk to you about, uh, or my, the title of my talk is Never Ask a Star Its Age. And uh, I wanna try and have a bit of a larger discussion about how we can try and understand the ages of stars in our galaxy. These are some of the various institutions. Uh, we mentioned the City University of New York, which is where I did my PhD in a lot of this work. The American Museum of Natural History, which is where I'm based now and where I've actually been based for the last 10 years. Uh, Hunter University, uh, yeah, Hunter College, Hunter University um, is another institution in New York. And then BDNYC in the top left is the research group that I'm a part of, which is based between three uh, PIs at different institutions in the city, including uh, Hunter, City University of New York, and the American Museum of Natural History. So I just need to start by thanking my funding sources. Um, I'm going to walk you through a quick little outline, is that I wanted to talk a little bit about my path to a PhD. I don't know uh, what career stage folks are in this webinar, but I think it's important to see the kind of path that astronomers Scientists are real people, and I want to kind of show off some of the path that I've taken um, to get to where I am. I want to give an introduction on stars and, and kind of refresh about why this is a challenging subject to understand how old stars are. And then we're going to get into the meat of things. We're going to ask, I'm going to ask you to guess uh, the age of stars without being able to ask them, without being able to uh, have them tell us what their age is and how astronomers try and do that and then point out the space telescopes that we use to do so. And then if there's time, I have some extra things. I'll introduce what a light curve is, uh, and we'll see if we have time for that. So um, as I said, I, well, I haven't said this, but on my path to my PhD, I've grown up all over the world. Um, I sound American because I'm half American. I'm also half British, but my parents uh, are international school teachers. And so I actually got to grow up in many different places. This is a photo of me in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, in front of a leatherback turtle. Actually, I'm behind the leatherback turtle. I'm not standing on it, don't worry. Um, I'm just in the back, but this is, uh, it was incredible to grow up in these many different places. Trinidad and Tobago, um, I lived in, in Bangladesh as well, and I went to high school in Egypt. And so I'm sitting here, I hope you can see my mouse here in the front row, uh, and I graduated in front of the Sphinx and, and, and the pyramids of Giza. Um, and so after that, I decided that I wanted to go to university and my father uh, is from Connecticut. And so I chose to go to Wesleyan University, which is a small liberal arts college in Connecticut. Let me just show you very beautiful. There's the New England fall. Um, and it has an observatory, the Van Vleck Observatory, right in the middle of campus. And so that was very exciting for me. I was able to do a undergraduate research experience in one of my earlier summers where I went to Vassar College, another uh, beautiful small liberal arts school in, in uh, upstate New York. And uh, I worked with Professor Deborah Elmgreen, who is now the president of the International Astronomers Union. 
And uh, my project then was looking at the uh, starburst galaxies and star formation within these galaxies. And so here's an example of two galaxies forming and all the little specks you can see are actually not just individual stars, except for the ones with the big diffraction patterns that are actually within our galaxy. But in those galaxies, the, every kind of spot you can, might be able to see are areas of star forming regions. Um, and so my first project was just to look through and then count them in, in several galaxies. After I finished my undergrad, I went and worked at the American Museum of Natural History for four years. And so this is a photo of me working with elementary and middle school students. Uh, I got to actually go outside of my comfort zone, not just talk about astronomy, but handle live reptiles and show them to students and got to do a lot of amazing things. And so I'm very thankful for those four years I got to spend uh, stepping away from academia. And again, I think it's, I think it is valuable to like get out of the academic mindset before deciding if you want to go back in. But then I did decide to go back in and I started my PhD at City University of New York, which is on the left there. And then the American Museum of Natural History is over on the right. And so my research group that I ended up working with are based in both of those locations. And um, in the left photo, the two frontmost people are uh, Professor Kelly Cruz and Dr. Jackie Faraday. Um, and those are my main PIs. But when you're doing a PhD, it might be no surprise to anybody here, most of the time you're sitting at a computer. And uh, while it is exciting to be an astronomer, this is us observing technically, but we're using a telescope remotely. The telescope's in Hawaii and where uh, the three of us are based at the library at the museum. The first couple of years of a PhD, you do a variety of projects and classes. I luckily got to go to some, uh, some of these telescopes. This is the Magellan telescopes in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And that was a really great experience because these are big telescopes. And uh, I've got uh, pictures of some of them. So on the left, we're seeing um, one of the, the Magellan telescopes. And there's me for size at six feet. <laughs> and you can see the mirror is about twice my height. And so these are, these are massive telescopes um, over or the diameter of the mirror. Uh, and then over on the right is a, is a uh, observatory in Kitt Peak, Arizona where again, now the, now the diameter is a bit smaller, but it's still a really huge, and, and just look at the mount of that telescope. These are big machines. However, when you're there, you're still sitting on a computer. Uh, so it's not that much of a difference, but very, very great. Uh, and after these, uh, you also get to meet very interesting people and interesting things. I don't know if you can tell, but there's something quite interesting in the middle of this picture, right in the middle. If you look very closely, it's the head of something. It is a guanaco, which is a llama-like creature. Uh, it's related to a llama, kind of like a moose is to a deer. Um, and so they're all kind of related to one another and, and it was just roaming around the telescope. But then it came time to decide what was my PhD gonna be? What was my dissertation? And that's what this big red question mark was. It's like, what are you going to do? And when thinking about this, I like to take it from a big picture viewpoint. And if we think of human knowledge, all of it encompassed into this Pentagon, uh, although it's not really all of human knowledge, I would like encourage us to realize that Western academia is not the sole source of knowledge and definitely doesn't know everything. But inside of this human knowledge, there are going to be many different subjects within them. And if we zoom in on any one of these subjects, there's going to be subcategories as well. And even within these subcategories, there's going to be specific things. And, and a whole point of a PhD is to push the boundary of that body of knowledge just a little bit, just to find some little place that you can push further. And so, uh, although I told you this talk was about stars, it really is a bit about my PhD and kind of the things I've learned throughout my time getting this PhD. Uh, and so these are some of the images that are basically going to describe it, and you'll come to understand what these images mean, spinning stars, these groups of stars, this kind of plot in the bottom left, and uh, the kind of telescopes that I've used over the course of my PhD. So let's get into it and start talking about stars. First thing we need to know about stars is that they are different. I'm showing you a video here from the European Space Agency. And uh, what this text is explaining is that we're using the Hubble Space Telescope to zoom in on a cluster of stars. So these are a group of stars, and they've got a variety of stars within this group. We'll hear more about groups of stars later. But it's a big, beautiful star field, and we're going to zoom in, and we're going to create what's called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. 
Um, I'm not familiar with everyone's expertise and, and familiarity with this idea, so I'm going to walk ourselves through this diagram. But if we take these stars, we're going to do two things. We're going to line them up by color from left to right. So the blue stars are going to be over on the left, and the red stars are going to be over on the right. And then vertically, we're going to put the brightest stars at the top and the dimmest stars at the bottom. And that's all we're doing. We're just aligning, or aligning by color and by brightness. And we get this beautiful pattern here. Um, there's a lot going on in this feature, but I want to just focus on this main thing here, the main sequence stars. And I'll actually just pause the video. Um, and then what I want you to take away from this main sequence stars, this, this main sequence, this path here, is that we've got a very nice kind of line, a relationship, where over on the right, we've got the redder and dimmer stars. And on the left, we've got the bigger and bluer stars. And so we have this kind of relationship. There's no dim blue things. There's no big red things if we stay on the main sequence. Of course, stars over here get out of the way. Uh, they, they do get around that. But to understand why this line happens, we have to think about what is a star actually doing. And I like to think of a star as being, uh, the main thing about it is what's called hydrostatic equilibrium. This is a big fancy word. If we break it up, hydro meaning like fluids, static meaning stable, and equilibrium being balanced. And essentially what we need to do is balance the inward force of gravity and the outward force of, or, and, and with some outward pushing force, okay? So the whole idea between hydrostatic equilibrium is that we're gonna create something that is essentially round because gravity is pushing things in and something else is pushing out. We can talk about stars, but this is true also for planets as well. And so if we look at, for example, the Earth and Jupiter, they are big round things. They are also in hydrostatic equilibrium. It's, it's easier to understand the kind of pressure pushing back out with the Earth. You know, if we are uh, standing on the surface, there's, there's rocks beneath us and the kind of chemical bonds and the atomic bonds between those rocks and, and then the inner and outer iron core of the Earth. Those are things that are able to provide some kind of pressure back out. They're able to uh, create enough structure to push back against the force of gravity. When you go against something bigger like Jupiter, you actually aren't just satisfied. Uh, Jupiter is not held up, not just by the like bonds between its atoms or the, the molecules and, and uh, the structures of the atoms within them. It actually has some quantum mechanical effects going on in its core, which is a, a really cool thing to think about. Um, but at the same time, they've got some pressure pushing out as well. And so we've got a, a, a balance between gravity pushing in and something pushing out. Now with stars, they are so massive that neither of those things are gonna work. The atoms are getting slammed together. The temperatures and pressures are too high for even these kind of quantum mechanical effects. And so what has to happen is that a star needs to push back using uh, radiation. It needs to use radiation pressure. It needs to do nuclear fusion in its core to balance out the gravity, which means that for larger stars that are bigger, they have to burn hotter and will be burning blue uh, to remain balanced. They need to burn more energy. Um, I think I had a, do, Christian, do you have all the poles? Right? Can you pick between them or are they in a certain order? I, I can pick uh, in whatever you tell me, it's fine. Okay. So yeah. why don't we just go ahead and ask uh, number three there, what kind of star would you like to live around? Uh, and I'll just show this next slide here uh, as an example of the different types of stars that there are on that main sequence area that I was pointing to before. So we've got big blue stars, and these are the sizes to scale, big blue stars on one side, small red stars on the other. Now the big blue ones are gonna have to give off they're, they are necessarily hotter. And maybe in your mind, you're thinking red means hot, blue means cold, when I think about like water faucets or something. But I want you to instead think about it in terms of like flames on a, on a stove, right? The blue flame is hotter than the red flame. Uh, slightly different physics, but we've got our blue stars that are hot and our red stars that are fainter and cooler. And so we're around the G-type sun. The sun is a G-type here. And the, the story behind these letterings is a classic example of astronomers not giving up their old ways. There used to be an order to it. And then they realized the order was wrong. In fact, it was a brilliant scientist 
um, Cecilia Payne Gabashkin, uh, I always butcher their last name, but uh, Cecilia Payne, who uh, as her thesis realized, oh, okay, everyone's choosing the sun. It's a safe bet, safe bet. For those of you going around the blue star, that might be no a bad wonder. decision. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you in a second. Um, yes. But anyway, the, 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 the order of these, basically we had an A, B, C, D, E, F, G order at one point. Somebody came along and realized, no, that's the wrong order. Rather than just reset it and go A, B, C, D again, we've kept the same letters and that's why it's O, B, A, F, G, K. Terrible. But uh, here's why you might not want to be around a blue one. It's because a blue star, because it's burning so hot, it has to burn so much fuel so quickly to stay that hot. And so an O-type star, by our models, only lives for about 4 million years, compared to, say, a B-type star, which can survive for 15 million years. And I'm going to go through all of these, and you're going to quickly see that the size of your star will not just say how big your color is, but also how long you're going to live. So now that 50 million years shrinks in comparison to an A-type star that can live to up to 800 million years. And again, that's going to shrink in comparison to an F-type star, which can live to up to 4 billion years long. And we're going to go through a few more quickly. FGK and FGKs all live to about tens of billions of years long until we get to the M-type stars, which are the far, the faintest, the smallest stars. And those ones, they actually, I barely could fit it onto the slide, can live up to 7 billion years or 700 billion years. And so it's a fun thing to think about that all the M's, even all the K's that were born at the start of the universe are still alive to this day. And all the other types have probably, uh, if they were born right at the start of the first star formation, they might've gone away. So hopefully this kind of introduction to stars has shown you that it's challenging to talk about their age. And when you look up at the night sky from now on, I want you to realize you're not just seeing things that are very far away, you're seeing stars that are in very different parts of their lives as well. And it's a real challenge because we're not talking about, but we're talking about a huge range of ages they can be. Uh, and when they're happily burning their hydrogen, it's they're, they don't look that different necessarily. So we need to find a way to understand not only this whole range, but just how old the star is at any given point in its life. And that brings us to our next question, is how are we going to guess the age of a star without being able to ask it? And the way I want to do that is by uh, pointing out that you already know how to do it. You've done it yourself, because I'm going to show you this picture right here of two people who study the ages of stars. And let's go ahead and put up that second poll. Because your or your or the the one about humans, please, because your brain has probably already done something and figured out which one of these two is older. So if we throw up the poll, uh, what did you use to figure out which how uh, which human was the older one? Right? What of their physical features did you look at? And I don't include all of their physical features here. I'm sure there are other ones that you could think of, and if you can think of them, please go ahead and put them into the chat. But of these three, which ones did you use in this case to try and figure out which of the of the two stellar researchers rate? I will give it a few more seconds and then we'll. OK, yes, I'll actually, uh, as you're doing that, point out that the one on the right is me. But the one on the left is Andy Skumanich or Andrew Skumanich, Professor Andrew Skumanich, who started this field of research 50 years ago. And this photo is taken from last spring when there was the 50 years of Andy Skumanich uh, conference. So let's see, most people use their facial features and some people use their hair. And the height, you're right, is a bit of a, of a, of a red herring in this case. Um, it turns out height is a good predictor for ages at some point, but not for all of them. So I use this example of humans uh, as an analogy because like we said, this is something that your brain automatically does. If you're looking at this group of humans and you're not able to ask them their ages, your brain, you're, you are able to do a pretty good job of putting them in an order of age, right? And the way your brain is doing that is because you've built up a model over time in your head based on the physical characteristics of the people. So, for example, if we've got these three different ages here and 
here are some of the models that we might use. We might be able to say, okay, I know that with, with hair, it grows in a certain way with age, right? Um, the height of the person also changes with age at certain points, and maybe the height's only really valuable for the first like 10 years of their life. And then also number of teeth could be an example too. But the point is what your brain is doing is combining these different physical characteristics and your models for how they evolve with age and using them against each other to try and guess, the best guess somebody's age. Um, now, we can do the same thing with stars, except we can't do it with their facial features or, or their, their hair or whatever. We need to do it with something else. And so that's where Andy started this whole field off. Uh, and 50 years ago, he created this plot. And you can tell it's a 50-year-old plot because it's not very well uh, designed, if you ask me. So I'm going to walk us through it. I'm putting this golden arrow here to show age and time. And so on the left, we've got younger things. And on the right, we've got older things. And then on this y-axis, we have, uh, there's a few different things going on. And so I have to use slightly different words. But basically, at the top, there's either more of the thing, or it's moving faster. And at the bottom, there's less or slower moving. And so the three physical characteristics that Andy put on this plot were the lithium abundance, like how much lithium was showing up in the star, calcium uh, two, or plus emission, so it's kind of a magnetic activity of the star, and then also the one that we're going to focus on in this talk is the rotation period, or how quickly the star was spinning. The important thing here, though, is not what these uh, characteristics are, but that there is an age dependence with them. And in fact, uh, there's only about a dozen data points on here, and uh, our sun is, is all the data points right in here, uh, over on the like oldest group. And so things have changed quite a bit. But like I said, we're only going to focus about the rotation. And the important thing is that there is a trend as the rotation changes over time. So when I talk about rotation of a star, I mean that the star is spinning. And as people here on Earth, we know about things that spin, right? We've got an understanding that uh, unless you're Leonardo DiCaprio in a, in a Christopher Nolan movie, things will slow down over time, right? If there is some kind of force acting on them. In general, things are going to slow down over time. So the things that are slowing down these stars is what we call magnetic braking. These stars have, uh, if they have a dynamo inside of them, so some kind of way of make, making this magnetic field, this magnetic field will then surround the star. And if they have uh, stellar winds coming off the surface, here's an image of a coronal mass ejection coming off the sun, for example. Uh, when that coronal mass ejection comes out, it'll interact with the magnetic field of the star and take angular momentum away as it extends out into space. Uh, you can think about a ice skater. As they bring their arms in, they're able to speed up how quickly they're spinning. Well, what's happening is the reverse. The coronal mass ejection is going out, and it's as if the ice skater is putting their arms out and slowing down over time. Now, I showed you a bunch of different stars uh, earlier in the first section, these OBA FGKMs. Now, we only are going to focus on the last four spectral types, the FGKM, because only these types of stars have that kind of magnetic dynamo. Uh, dynamo. They, they're the only ones that have a magnetic field like this. Turns out those bigger stars, they have a different kind of structure and don't create an appreciable magnetic field. So these FGKM stars, we have some way to see them slow down over time. But we still need to find a way to measure how quickly they are spinning. And the way we do that is by looking at star spots on their surface. So here's imagery of our sun, and you can see star spots on the surface of the star. They are moving across the surface of the star over the rotation period of the star. And so for the sun, uh, we can just watch them go from one side of the sun to the other, and that will tell us how quickly the sun is spinning, which uh, we may as well do our final poll right now. Can we put up the question of how old do you think, or at what point in the sun's life do you think we are at? Do we think the sun is a baby star, teenage star, middle-aged star, or a senior star? I, I can even give you some information about how quickly the star is spinning, if that would help. It takes about 30 days for it to complete one revolution. 
and actually makes uh, looking at these star spots a little challenging because uh, some of these star spots won't last for 30 days. So we don't, we rarely see one star spot make it all the way around, but we can sell from how long it takes to go from one side to the other. It's 30 days around. Um, and Dr. Santanu Roy, I see your question about, uh, oh, let's see what we said. Middle-aged star, good. Oh, okay. People, people know their stuff pretty well. Yes, the sun is uh, right about in the middle of a typical G star's life. And I'll, I'll be able to show you that in, in uh, a second on a different kind of plot. Ah, uh, okay. Wow. Nice. Sorry. I just saw another question asking about, oh, wait. So uh, let me finish with Dr. Sant Santanu Roy. Uh, why are the spectral names ordered so? What is the basis of the nomenclature? I hope I answered that earlier, but essentially it was one system. We realized it needed to be reshuffled and we didn't change the letters. And so it used to be alphabetical. Then we realized it was in the wrong order and we've kept it the same. It's not a very good thing. And if you're familiar with astronomy, there are many examples of this, such as the magnitude system isn't very well designed either, but we still use it. Um, I'll get to the other questions in a second. I just want to keep uh, going for now and point out that this is really nice and it's a really clear example for the sun, right? We can see the star spots moving across. However, when you're looking at a star far away, this is what you see. You're seeing like pixels. Each star is maybe light falling over a single pixel. It's basically a point source. And so you're not seeing the star spots move. You're not seeing a nice pretty picture like this. You have to do something else. And what you're able to do is create what's called a light curve. And so a light curve is the measure of the star's brightness over time. So up on the left here, we've got a simulated star with a star spot on its surface. It's a nice big dark star spot. And you'll notice that when the star spot is rotating around, when it's facing away from us, the, the rest of the, the star looks very bright. But when it comes into view, the brightness goes down because this darker spot is facing us. We're not seeing as much of the bright surface of the sun. And so if we measure that over time, we get this light curve. And so on the x-axis, I'm showing you time in days. So this is basically the brightness at that different time. And on the y-axis, I'm showing you the brightness or normalized flux, which is another way of saying brightness, but we're averaging, we're dividing the brightness by the average so that if it's average brightness, it's at one. And if it's brighter than normal, it's more than one. And if it's less bright than normal, it's lower than one. So this is a light curve. And this is this is a little cartoon version, a simulated one, but I can show you a, a, real, a real version of one right here. And so this is taken from the test space telescope. I'll tell uh, you more about that later. But again, we're seeing time on the x-axis, the number of days that we've been observing it for, and the brightness, percent change in brightness in this case. And if you notice, we've got even a little flare right here, kind of like that coronal mass ejection from before, although this one's much bigger. And what we can do is we can take these light curves. We can, this is just for one star, but we can do it for many stars. Uh, and I've changed my uh, slides around here. Uh, so that's a little teaser that we're going to do it for many stars. But hopefully now we can understand that we could figure out the spin of a single star. And if we know the relationship between spin and age, we'll be able to get their age. But we still need to calibrate that relationship. Oh, okay. I'm seeing some great questions, which I want. I realize I, I, I opened up Pandora's box. I need to stop looking at the questions for a second. I'm going to keep uh, moving with the, the presentation and I wanna deal with the questions in a moment, but uh, I wanna set up how we make this age spin relationship work. Because we've got these F, G, K, and M stars that have a magnetic field that are gonna slow down over time. And now with these light curves, we have a way of measuring their rotation. But how do we combine this with age? What are we gonna do to really calibrate? We can go back to our analogy with humans. Uh, humans, we've got a wide range of ages in this photo. It might be hard to say that someone's exactly 16 or exactly 35 or something. We, we would need, what would make it a lot easier is if we could look at groups of students, cohorts, that are or groups of people that are all the same age, right? So if we had a class of, say, 10-year-olds, we could get a really good average for the average height at 10 years old. Same thing with all these different age groups as well. So what we want to do is we want to find stars that are all the same age. And so what I'm showing you here is a visualization of uh, real data. 
So the only thing that's not real is this image of the Milky Way, because we can't see the Milky Way. We never have a telescope out there like that. But now as we're flying in, we're seeing the real 3D positions of the stars in our galaxy. This is using the planetarium software at the American Museum of Natural History. And as we get in close, you're going to see this big teal square, which is about 100 light years across, to give you a bit of a, of a sense of scale. And your eyes can already maybe pick out these over densities of stars. Now, they've been brightened up so that you can really see them. But these groups of stars, these clumps of stars, are little laboratories for us to get ages. Because any two random stars aren't likely to be in the same place as one another. So when we see these over densities, these clumps, that's an information for us that they did form together. It's far too unlikely for them to just be randomly there together. We can assume they are the same age. And so something that has come out of the Gaia Space Telescope, for example, has been finding loads and loads of these clumps. And what I'm showing here now are these kind of uh, these clumps highlighted in certain colors, to try and show you the regions of space that define these clumps. And so each one of these groups is a laboratory at a different age that we can then go into and try and measure the rotation periods for. So for example, if we were looking at, say, the Pleiades, which hopefully or is, a, is a great object to look at, um, there might be a range of spectral types within the Pleiades. And we could measure the rotation periods of each of the stars inside of the Pleiades. And from there, we can get how quickly each star is spinning and know that they're all the same age. And what we can do is we can put them on a plot where we're looking at the color of the star, or which is also its spectral type. So I'm putting the spectral types on the upper axis, and this is a, a color. So basically, the, the like we said, the blue and the red stars, there's a, there's a progression. Um, and so we're, the type of the star is running along the x-axis, and then how quickly the star is rotating is running along the y-axis. And we can see this is how the rotation periods are distributed for stars at this age, for this group. Again, I just want to highlight that this is all thanks to space-based missions. I'm showing uh, the Gaia telescope at the bottom there, as well as Kepler and the, the TESS uh, NASA missions. And TESS is basically the mission for my PhD. Uh, it can measure rotation periods for basically almost any star in the night sky. It, it has a mission plan that looks all across the sky. And the way it does that is it's got a huge field of view. And so that's what this GIF on the left is showing. It's, it's got this four cameras that have huge pixels. So you don't get as much resolution. You're covering a huge area. Each camera has 22, uh, let me get this right, 22 degrees of, of square degrees. And then no, it's 22 degrees on each side. And then uh, it's four of them in a row. And so it's able to cover a huge area at, all at once. And it stares in that field of view for a month. And then it moves around. And so that's what this other GIF is showing, is that each one of these 28-day uh, sectors is going to stare and measure the brightness of the stars every 30 minutes. And then it's going to pan around into a new sector. And basically, uh, in one year, it covers one hemisphere. And in another year, it co covers another hemisphere. And so we're able to measure uh, brightness of the stars all across the sky. So. Going back to Andy's plot here with the basically three rotation period points and the, the trend between them, we can translate it to uh, not just these three points, but now, which are only for G-type stars, we can now do it for a variety of stars. And so now we can look at how the gyrochronology or the study of how stars spin looks today. And let me just get rid of this green line because uh, but the sun was one of the original points. The sun, I said, takes 30 days. It would be off this, this plot. We're really only looking at quite young things. Uh, I put that golden arrow again there. Uh, it was showing time before. And I want that to kind of be internalized in your head that the older things are at the top of this plot. And I'll explain that again in a second. Uh, I mentioned that these uh, stars, the spectral types, you can see along the top of the x-axis. And so... Again, we've got our F, G, K, and M type stars. And on the, on the bottom of the x-axis, you can see that the, the type of the star lines up with a certain temperature. That's the, how hot it is. So temperature, color, mass, spectral type, all line up with one another. 
And what we're showing here are three different uh, groups of stars. I showed you the Pleiades before, which is in dark blue. We uh, an older group, Recepi, 670 million years in light blue. And then in orange is a billion year old group, NGC 6811, uh, which I think would be a beautiful name for a boy. And, and what we can see is that all of the young stars, the Pleiades are spinning more quickly because again, our y-axis is how quickly the star is spinning. They're spinning more quickly than the blue stars, Persepi, or the light blue stars, Persepi, and then the orange ones are spinning more, are spinning slower than the light blue ones. And so we've got the ages stacking on top of each other really nicely for the F, G, and K stars. Now you might be noticing that there's a big pileup over in the M's, and you're absolutely right because that was the main focus on a part of my dissertation. It was trying to understand, uh, I, I did less about trying to understand it, but at least describing how these stars are kind of piling up over here. And one of the thoughts is that uh, maybe their braking mechanism hasn't turned on properly yet. And so they're all spinning quite quickly because as they are young, uh, as, as stars form, they condense, the, the, the figure skater is bringing their arms in, and they haven't found a way to lose that angular momentum yet. And maybe they don't start to lose it until this, like, say, 670 million years old. And this kind of migration of light blue stars up to here is them slowing down. Uh, you also might notice that there's not much going on down here at younger ages. Well, it turns out that a lot of those pumpings, those groups that we saw uh, in the video before, are really young groups. And so that was another main fe feature of my uh, defense was to to try and create rotation period distributions for these younger ages as well. But when I say young, I wanna point out that young is a very relative term, right? Uh, Pleiades, for example, at 120 million years old is younger than the time when Stegosaurus was on the earth. So Stegosaurus never saw the Pleiades. Similarly, stars in upper Scorpius uh, are about 10 million years old. And so the last common ancestor between humans and chimpanzees also never saw those stars. So these stars, while young, aren't that young. They're, uh, or, or I mean, they, they live on the time scale of major events here on Earth. And I think that's an important thing to take away as well. When you look up at the night sky, it's an evolving and moving thing. We're seeing it only at a snapshot. So hopefully that explains my uh, path to my PhD as well as some of the questions that I've had to try and think about along the way. Uh, before I get into the bonus lectures, I just wanna put up those conclusions again, that stars slow down over time. We have to use groups of stars to understand that slowdown. Light curves tell us how fast they spin and that space-based missions really help make this possible. So the, I, I talked a lot about this kind of bigger picture of looking at the age of these stars, but Something else came up in my research uh, is that I got to look at a lot of light curves. And so I want to talk about some interesting light curves that I saw. And again, as a reminder, we've got uh, our light curve is based off of uh, the kind of features of the star spots on the surface of the star. And so how quickly it spins will determine some of the shape of the light curve as well as other things as well. But to kind of show off, the weirdness of some of these light curves, I'd like us to use another analogy of this light curve not being, uh, this light curve also looks like the wave front of music, of, of sound, for example. And so I wanna convert these uh, rotation periods into sound so that we can use the kind of understanding we have of sound to know when things are different. So I'm gonna play some sounds. I've converted them. I've shifted the pitch of these periods into an audible frequency. Uh, if it gets very loud, I apologize. I don't really have a very good way of controlling the sound. But the last time I did this, somebody said, oh, that was loud. So be aware that there's some sound coming. I shouldn't be too loud, but there you go. And so that is representing how quickly the star is rotating. If it's rotating faster, that pitch will be higher. If it's rotating slower, that pitch will be lower. Um, but there are other things that could be affecting this. So I'm going to play two sounds now. Did you notice a difference? I'll play them again. Uh, 
uh, hopefully you recognize that there was a difference in the volume between them or the amplitude of, of, the, of the sound. And so here I'm showing two of our simulated stars here. And this would be like the pink one would be the one on the left. It's got a larger star spot. And so the amplitude of, of the change in brightness is going to be greater as the bigger star spot comes in and out of view, while the smaller star spot is only going to change the brightness slightly. And that would be the purple one down below. But there's another thing that comes into it as well, which is the shape of the light curve. So again, I'm going to play two sounds and see if you notice a difference. Oh, let's try that again. Sorry. <laughs> oh. Now the first one was a simple sine wave like this. And I'll play it again. The repeating shape was this nice sine curve up and down. But the second one, and here it comes again, is this sawtooth pattern. It's quite sharp, it has, but it is, it's still repeating the same amount as, as frequently. So it's the same note, but the shape of it is very different. The shape of the waveform, which uh, the repeating pattern is changing. And you might notice, or if, I don't know if people are into like house music or EDM or whatever, but the sound, you can play around with the wavefront. And so you actually see this in kind of techno music as well. They, they use these saw waves and square waves and change the wavefront. But the main takeaway I want you to notice is that a lot of the light curves I've been showing you with just a single star spot create this pattern here, the sine wave, this nice gentle up and down. But the repeating patterns that we see in some of these light curves look a lot more like these saw waves. So now I'm showing you not uh, a repeating pattern, but what, what the repeating pattern is. So these next plots are just like, would be just the red features here, just what repeats from cycle to cycle. And if you notice, these are some bizarre shapes, really sudden up and downs, hills, valleys, crests, divots. Um, and these things are repeating over and over again. In fact, they're repeating very frequently. These things are only happening around small red, uh, small rapidly spinning end warps. So these are young things as well. And they all are spinning less than a day or about a day in rotation period. So they're rapidly spinning, yet these features are staying with them. It's really unclear what could be causing this. Some of the best models for describing it are that perhaps uh, there's a disk of material around, or there's uh, some clouds that have been stuck in the magnetic fields of the star and are being dragged along at kind of a what we would call geostationary orbit. You think about geostationary satellites, they stay around the same area of the, of the Earth as they orbit around. Uh, the same is potentially true for these things. There might be something stuck at the stellar stationary orbit around them that are clumping in these bizarre ways. Uh, we don't notice, and uh, if normally when you look for disks, these disks are gonna be warmer and at a different temperature than the sun. So you might see an infrared excess and we don't see that with these things, partly because if you were to, uh, these disks, if they are at this orbit, they have to be so close. So there's some theories that there's a disk or there's some dust or there's a mixture of disk, dust, and spots that make it. But one of the things that I found in my work is that I found these two uh, complex rotators on the left these with these bizarre shapes. But when you looked at them later, one of them lost its complexity entirely. It went back to just a simple kind of sinusoidal shape later on. And so I'm showing the repeating pattern uh, at slightly different times in these plots. And so each row is one object. Um, and so these things, uh, some people call, or complex rotator is the name that I have. Uh, it's very, these are very new objects. There's only about seven papers on them total. Uh, and so they're fascinating. They need more follow-up. And luckily, uh, I've been able to win some money to continue to research them, which I'm going to keep doing at the American Museum of Natural History. So this is kind of like a check back later, and maybe I'll have some more cool light curves to show you for them. But uh, there, there's definitely an interesting thing that kind of pops out at looking at young spinning objects.
So I'll go back to my conclusions and hope to finish any other questions we have.